चैप्टर फोर रूल्स फॉर द लाइफ ऑफ एन एडवांस्ड डिसाइपल A disciple is a person who submits his will to the divine will. He resigns from his free will. This is a very profound concept which guides the human path toward the source of light. What is this divine will? When we read the inspired scriptures of the world, we find out that the divine will is a five pointed star it is beauty goodness justice joy and freedom when these five aspects are synthesized in our consciousness and when they control our thoughts our words our actions we say that we are synchronized with the divine will one thing must be noted here we must not just have one of these aspects but all of them for example if we strive toward joy without beauty goodness justice and freedom we are not synchronized with the divine will all these five aspects of the divine will must manifest through our thoughts our words our deeds this is how a person disciplines himself and becomes a disciple when all these aspects are realized and lived one can be a transmitter of the divine will everything that a person does against these five aspects follows his own free will free will is precious but it does not lead a person to the realization of these five aspects of the divine will it turns into an instrument of corruption man is a mixture of divine and human if the human will rejects the divine will man falls into the traps of his body emotions and thoughts if he conquers his human will his free will merges and fuses one with the divine will and he becomes a master a master is one who masters his human will and makes it a transmitter of the divine will a disciple's responsibility is to spread the divine will upon the earth because he knows that only the divine will will destroy pain suffering ugliness hatred injustice and slavery on earth in order to be able to fuse with the divine will throughout the ages following rules are given number 1 a disciple must contact his soul the soul is the inner watch the inner presence the little voice within the conscience the disciple must make a contact with it when a real contact is made the life of the disciple begins to change and be transformed once this inner presence is contacted it turns into a guide and makes you feel whether you are living in harmony with the divine will or not it immediately rings the bell in your heart if the thoughts you are thinking are not in harmony with the five pointed star 
or if the words you are speaking or the actions you are taking are not in harmony with the five-pointed star. Whenever you do, feel, speak or think anything that is in harmony with the divine will, you feel an expansion of consciousness and a deeper need for creativity and for service. When contact with the inner watch is established, you almost hear its voice, its silent voice, and you obey that voice. Obedience to the higher means, building bridges, connecting links, communication with higher sources. Obedience leads to unity, cooperation and synthesis. Through unity, the higher sources, they begin to manifest in your life. Almost everyone has had an experience of receiving this inner guidance from within. Such guidance is evidence of the existence of the inner watch. The second rule is to build a bridge between you and the world beyond. This world is often called the subjective world. It is not easy to build such a bridge of consciousness. We know that we live in the presence of an invisible world which always surrounds us everywhere, but we are seldom conscious of it. People with whom we build strong ties are all around us. Subjectively, as well as physically, and it is possible to be conscious of their presence if we take some necessary steps. What are these necessary steps? Know that they are around you and that they are aware of whatever you think, you speak, you feel or do. Converse with them mentally Send them love, joy and blessings. Go to sleep thinking about some special ones. By following these steps, you soon will find their protective and guiding influence upon you. These steps have nothing to do with mediumistic or spiritualistic phenomena. You do not channel these people. You do not give your body to them. You do not force them to materialize, but you contact them with your thoughts. A disciple must live a dual life. He must live a life of spiritual realization and a physical, a practical life. He must live a life on the physical plane and a life in subjective levels in sleep or through telepathic communication. It is only by living a dual life that the disciple achieves balance in his field of service. A disciple does not read auras or past lives. There is a great, great danger in such actions. A disciple is occupied with the future achievements of man and he leaves the past alone. The third rule is that a disciple is not trapped in useless arguments. He tries to follow the path of the most essential and lets all non-essentials fade away. The most essential is related to his or others spiritual evolution and to the future. He does not waste his time with the past if it does not reveal the future. He does not waste time creating an ego out of the past. A disciple always try to transform his own life. 
it is good to have lots of information knowledge diplomas or certificates even titles but one must know that they are not the essence of man it is the essence the consciousness the life of man that must change one can be sure that he is going through transformation when he tries to be something better than he was when he tries to see what to do and what not to do when he tries to build a new image for himself to be true to himself and never to force himself upon others a disciple must develop inclusiveness through which he will expand his aura and receive all kinds of impressions which will help him to render his service more efficiently inclusiveness works under the law of discrimination and discernment it is like a musician who chooses the instruments and melodies to compose his symphony inclusiveness is not a collection of conflicting elements or a creation of chaos it is a process of assim- assimilation of those elements which will help for the future development of a greater beauty and the future development of a greater apparatus for service in expanding the consciousness one becomes more inclusive and sees both the outer and the inner side of every event and every relationship our expanding consciousness is the only force that transforms life because any change in consciousness in- induces a corresponding change in the chemistry of thoughts feelings and the body mechanism every change in consciousness creates a response through a corresponding change in the etheric centers which control the glands and organs knowingness does not change the consciousness but striving for new achievements and mastery over the personality does in one of the schools i attended for a short time we were given a method to transform our lives it was very simple we had to go to the headmaster and sit with him for a while and ask him teacher what don't you like in me he used to say very simple things such as do not play with your nose do not shake your feet while sitting on the chair do not bite your fingernails he used to speak about only one thing after having observed us if we were successful in overcoming the things that he had mentioned then we could go back and ask more when he used to see that a boy or a girl was really serious and could overcome things in his character he used to give difficult tasks related to emotional and thought patterns and vices then he used to direct his eyes to spiritual discipline once in a class he said all the information you gather from books is dangerous for you if you have not achieved the fundamentals the fundamentals were those things that should be conquered before the spiritual discipline could be given teacher i said one day why is knowledge dangerous before transformation because he said it develops ego and in the future the ego makes any transformation totally impossible without transformation man cannot be his true self the teacher acts as your 
inner watch and through his efforts you eventually come into contact with your own inner watch it has been recommended that one be very careful in choosing his teacher and not lead himself to people friends or relatives who may damage his being by suggesting or ordering things that originate from wrong motives or from ignorance a disciple is one who has chosen his teacher the greatest happiness for a disciple is the presence of his teacher who cares for his pure spiritual progress and suffers for his failures the teacher labors to give a new birth to his disciples transformation means to eliminate all those elements which prevent the process of subordinating your free will to the divine will what may a pseudo teacher do if you put your destiny in his hands he may take advantage of your errors and faults he may hurt you by belittling you he may feel superior to you which develops his ego he may feel satisfaction in exaggerating your errors and your faults he may misuse you or rule you he may fabricate faults that you probably don't even have you must be careful about these points if someone ask you to tell him his weaknesses first of all You should never tell people about their errors until they sincerely ask you to do so or if they are confronting a serious danger. It is even possible that after they know that you know their faults they will hate you. Sometimes it happens that the one you choose to correct you impresses in you through his ignorance weaknesses that you don't even have sometimes his judgment may not be correct and you feel rebellion in any case you must know that 95% of those who criticize you are full of doubtful motives jealousy hatred the urge to hurt you or the urge to feel supremacy there are many idiots who hear something about you and accept it as truth and force it upon you as if it were a fact your real friends do not bring you trash but stand as big brothers protecting you from any attack you must also know that the most dangerous people are those who study the teaching to gain a superiority b increase their own vanity c manipulate others d nourish racial national and personal ego e use the teaching against the teaching Before he imparts the teaching the disciple must try to find the motive and the level of people who are anxious to learn The day will come when the teaching will again be given to only a hand few A disciple tries to observe his life from the viewpoint of future attainments What is the difference between attainment and achievement? Attainment is related to our beingness, our transformation, our essence and our spiritual future. For example, to be a disciple is an attainment. To be an adept is a great attainment. achievement is related to the present to the world to the personality 
For example, one achieves a position. He becomes a doctor or a lawyer. He builds a great business. He conquers an enemy. These are achievements but not attainments. Attainment is a step-by-step -step increase of spirit and mastery over matter. Through attainment, one may also achieve. But through achievement, one may build hindrances for future attainments. In attainment, we have striving. In achievement, we have efforts. In attainment, we have aspiration and vision. In achievement, we have objectives and goals. You are going to visualize a state of attainment. Look at your present life and see what must be changed in your life so that your attainment becomes a possibility. You can visualize yourself as a disciple, a world disciple dedicated to the salvation of humanity. You can see yourself as a master related to some very important activity. When you do this, you create striving within you toward your vision. A disciple is a progressive light. The vision of our attainment creates in us the urge for commitment. Only after a real commitment does the transformation of our nature really start. Commitment is subordination of your present human will to the will of the future vision. A disciple loves loneliness. He likes to be alone with himself and with his responsibilities at least occasionally because while in loneliness he can renew himself he can recharge his energies and establish closer contacts with the higher worlds one of the paths leading to shambhala is loneliness Loneliness is not only a physical condition, but also a psychological one. Your frequency becomes so high and your penetration becomes so deep that you no longer merge with all that is around you. You can be in a multitude, but feel alone. As the disciple advances, he becomes lonelier until he reaches the frequency of the self of the Atman, in which the illusion of loneliness disappears and he merges one with the self. But to reach such a condition, he must walk the path of loneliness to save energy and time and concentrate his life on his mission. This is why the great, great ones have always passed the major part of their lives in the wilderness. A disciple does not deceive people. If by any chance he is trapped in any deception, he feels great pain in his soul and he tries to heal the wounds he has created in others. A disciple also does not pretend. He lives as he is. He neither tries to cover himself nor tries to give a false image of his superiority. Most of the criticism people make about others is a way to create a false image about themselves. People think that by belittling others, they can appear great themselves. We call this monkey psychology. A disciple always try to help anyone who is under attack. He never condemns, 
but understands. Finding fault in others is a very subtle means of self-deception and pretension and it is the result of an inferiority complex. A disciple neither flatters people nor accepts flattery. He does not curse anyone nor flatter anyone. He tries to see people just as they are and their weaknesses evoke compassion in him. He approaches human weaknesses not through the path of condemnation and criticism, but through the path of understanding, compassion and readiness to uplift people. Flattery is an effort to build a false image in others to build an ego in others. When one develops an ego in someone else, this ego will be an obstacle on the path of that other person. It will take him ages to destroy it and find his true real self. In flattery and curses, one builds false images for the subject. Average people easily identify with such images. They are drawn away from reality and they try to live by the false standards created by flattery or by curses. A disciple constantly works for the purification of his aura. The aura is purified through seven steps. Right contact, right relationship, right thinking, right emotions, right speech, right actions, and right reception. Right contact. Every contact is either constructive or destructive, either enlightening or confusing. A disciple must always try to work for the manifestation of the plan. The purpose of the plan is to spread more love, more light and more right human relationship. Wrong contact wastes your time and energy and involves you with problems that bring pain and suffering into your life. Right contact must be established not only with people, but with invisible forces, beings and teachers. Some people have wrong contact. They contact invol in involutionary forces, elementals and astral entities. And they get into some serious trouble. Right contact is contact with those beings who expand your consciousness and lead you toward a higher state of being. Right relationship. Right relationship is based on three factors. Selflessness, service and cooperation. Your relationships must not be based on your self-interest. You must not use others for your own personal gain. Your relationship with another person must be based upon a service you both can engage yourselves in. It, mu it must be a noble service that will bring you closer to each other, to develop your talents, to help each other to cultivate more talents and to be more productive in the field of your service. Relationships degenerate if one person seeks his own personal interest at the expense of another. Cooperation is the ability to utilize in the best way one's time, 
energy and knowledge in order to make his service more productive. In cooperation, one slowly learns to understand the values of others and to adjust himself to others in such a way that he and others become more productive. In right relationships, people evoke greatness, beauty, joy, courage, striving, and love from each other. In right relationships, people grow in understanding and in cooperation. Right thinking. Right thinking is elevating. It is enlightening, encouraging, supportive thinking. Your thoughts should carry beauty, goodness, truth, joy, and freedom. Otherwise, you are sowing dark seeds in space and hindering the evolution of others as well as yourself. When your mind thinks in the wrong way, instantly stop it, correct it, and make it think in the right way. Every time you catch your mind in a wrong activity and make it correct itself, it is a big win. It is a great victory for you. Only when you control your mind do you become a disciple. Your mind sometimes acts in monkey ways. It tries to deceive. It plays at depression. It shows off, works in vanity, tries to evoke self-pity. Stop these things, change them and make your mind think in the right way. All the great ones fought against their monkey minds and they mastered them. It is a great game and the rewards are even greater. When your mind engages in gossiping, slander, malice, try to catch it instantly at the right time. Because if you let it run on the wrong track, sometimes it is too late to put it back on the right track. Fortunately, each one of us has a inner watch, a watch within our hearts who lets us know when our mind goes wrong. Right emotions. Your emotional body is a very sensitive apparatus. It acts and reacts to many emotional waves existing in space. It is not easy to keep the emotional body from being influenced by these emotions. But an effort to put it in the right condition brings great rewards. One must start with simple disciplines. Every time you see that you are trapped in the fivefold net of darkness, namely anger, fear, hatred, greed, and jealousy, try to change the reaction of your emotional body and respond at a different, a higher frequency. Imagination is a great tool to control and transform your emotions. If it is used with creative efforts, for example, if you're feeling hatred, imagine the person you hate doing something great, which evokes your respect or love towards them. Your enemy is seen in a better light and in more detail if you look at him through your love and respect rather than through your hatred. Hatred obscures your intuition and forces you to take wrong decisions and wrong actions. You can work very practically. Whenever you hate, change it into love. 
change anger into understanding, fear into fearlessness, sorrow into joy, jealousy into inclusiveness, etc. Once you are able to control your emotions, you become a disciple. Discipleship is the path of mastery of your thoughts, your emotions and your actions. Right speech is a great sign of discipleship. A disciple always tries to speak at the right time to the point with the right dosage, right words and right emphasis. Right speech is speech that enlightens others, makes them creative, goal-oriented, healthy, free and joyful. Wrong speech belittles, humiliates, divides and creates fear and hopelessness. Wrong speech brings confusion and complication and leads people into painful and destructive directions. Right speech comes from our hearts. It is enlightened with our minds and charged with enthusiasm love and joy. A disciple gains trust and confidence through his right speech. Right actions are constructive, they are creative, they are beneficial and cooperative actions which are charged with love, beauty and joy. Right actions always build the future and never create bad karma. Wrong actions involve you with unending problems. Right actions are not only beneficial for everyone here, but they also create advancing life in the subtle world. Every wrong action here is an obstacle in the subtle world. Right reception is very important for a disciple. He must not only try to record impressions exactly as they come to him, but he must also have the power to discriminate and choose the channels of impression. He must try to keep his aura, his mind and heart pure so that higher impressions coming from his soul or still higher sources are registered in their purest state. Thus the disciple can be guided and led into great creative activities. If his communications with higher realms are pure. The greatest pitfall of a man is self-deception. Right thinking and right action prevent such a pitfall. Self-deception is a departure from your true self. This is a great disaster. Whenever one acts against his true self, he is a lost man. In reality, self-deception makes you not to exist because... Sorry, self-deception makes us not to exist because if you are not the self... You do not exist. You exist only when you are the self. A disciple occasionally goes into retreat. Retreats are not times of relaxation, but times of intense and concentrated spiritual labor. It is in the retreats that the disciple faces his highest obligations and tasks and works for them until they come into actualization. Retreats are used to clarify the vision, to contact the vision, to actualize the vision and to meet your true self. Thus, A true retreat is needed for the disciple to reach a peak point in his dedication and creativity. A disciple must practice 
shifting. This does not have a dictionary definition. Shifting here has a different meaning. Shifting means to change the point of your interest from a lower point to a higher point of interest. Shifting occurs in various dimensions. You may shift from 50 to 90 degrees. Sometimes you may shift 180 degrees. Sometimes you may shift from physical to mental or spiritual spheres or values. A true disciple is in continuous shifting toward new values, new space and new pole stars. Such a shifting is not emotional or forced by outer forces. It is a measured, balanced and systematically arranged move to higher states of consciousness. A disciple works and prepares for shifting. He does not let outer events force his shifting. He feels the right moment to use his energies for shifting. Shifting manifests through intense enthusiasm, dedication, firmness, stability, and the power of renunciation. A disciple always try to, he tries to create opportunities to cooperate with co-disciples. He does not compete with others. He loses himself to find the group self in discipleship. In discipleship, no one works for himself. No one claims that the work done was done by me. No one asks for any recognition for the work done. The completed work shines and gives joy to all co-workers. A disciple is more advanced when he forgets himself in the labor of cooperation. He advances more when he admires the beauty of his co-workers. He advances even more when he helps others to accomplish a labor without thinking about recognition. Thus a disciple advances through the steps of self-renunciation. If a disciple works to shine for himself, to show off and feel that he is somebody to be better than somebody else. He slowly prepares his own downfall. A disciple exercises strong control upon his inner and outer tongue so that he does not encourage his lower self to appear and obliterate his true, victorious, true self. One does not need recognition, but service and labor for the good of all. Om Shanti 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 Om